wanted to show you my um, big pink banana. I'm sorry? The Velvet Underground. Yeah. This is a reproduction of the album, you know, this is like the box set. But you, um, you know, it's the banana, but you can uh, peel it. <laughs> and it's a pink banana. Look at how glorious it is. That's messed up, man. Well, it's Andy Warhol. You know him. Yeah, you make sure that banana stays on there. Yeah. Are you ready to start? Yeah, sure. So I have to ask you a question. Like, they still make westerns, but I feel like it's kind of a dead-end genre. Whenever they make a western nowadays, they go, Oh, look at this. Somebody made a western. But what is a modern version of... Is there anything that could replace the Western for why we watch Westerns? Is there a genre like that? Well, I'll tell you, in my opinion, and I think this is maybe shared by many, but the Western was popular because of television. Gunsmoke, The Rifleman, Bonanza. uh, Rawhide. Rawhide. Anyways, so I think movies are just trying to catch up with how popular television westerns were because there was a market there but then they ended up making some great westerns but it did seem to have its day in the 60s and then maybe a little bit into the 70s but i do think it kind of fell out of popularity by the 80s yeah and it's just been every once in a while but people always like them you know if they stand out but to your question what was your question what is the modern version of a western like we like westerns because it was a lawless time there's a lot of similarity between the western and like fun old samurai movies yeah like it's about an honorable warrior that runs around and writes wrongs or doesn't and i don't know if there is a modern version of that i mean the the really the last westerns that I remember kind of watching are few and far between, but No Country for Old Men was kind of a Western, the Coen brother film. That's good. And again, something that Cormac McCarthy, the author, wrote as a book was uh, All the Pretty Horses Billy Bob Thornton tried to make with, uh, or he made with Matt Damon, if you remember. Mm -mm. So it's like whenever they make a Western, it kind of becomes an Academy-loved kind of film that's how rare it is and sometimes they stand out and sometimes they don't but i did hear of one called and to me it looked like a western but i don't even know if it is but it's like to hell or a hell or hell or high water i know that it was um yeah it was chris pine and uh ben can't remember his last name but it was supposed to be pretty good but i think that had a western feel to it but it might just be location the fact that it takes place in the southwest people assume it's a western But to your question, I think what's taken over as a Western is John Wick and anything Liam Neeson was doing. Oh, John Wick is absolutely... Like the Taken films. Yeah. Those are the new versions of the Western. Or that is what is carrying on the torch of the Westerns, are revenge movies. Yeah, anytime there's a movie where there's a guy outside of society doing a thing, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. That's interesting. They've been slighted. They're taking the law into their own hands. That's a Western. And there's guns, of course. (laughs) And obviously we have The Mandalorian. Yeah. Which... That's a Western feel. Literally a genre exercise in copying these three movies. Now, we had never seen these movies before, and they've always been on our list, obviously, just as movie fans. But it just takes a moment in your life to say, like, I need to sit down and actually watch them. But when you watch them, you realize... Everyone is cribbed from them. (laughs) This is why Tarantino started making movies. The Mandalorian music is completely based on this film. So many things came from these movies. So wait, you've never seen them before either? I never saw them, no. That's fun! Yeah. And like, this is the magic of this podcast. We're becoming better at movies because of it, and I like that. Yeah, we're becoming more knowledgeable, and it's never too late in life to to learn about these things. I I hope I don't say his name wrong, but like... So because of these movies, I know who Sergio Leone, Sergio Leone's, how do you say it? Sergio Leone is how I always said it. I, I didn't know a lot about this guy, but a lot of respect. Yeah. I always knew him because he would always get mentioned, you know, and he only made like six movies. S- seven or eight, but yeah. Yeah. Well, three of them were, well, like popular movies, like three of them were this and the other right. three was his Once Upon a Time movies. Which weren't actually connected. But people like to feel that they are in some way like that's why tarantino made once upon a time in hollywood you know that's why he wanted that title that's why robert rodriguez made once upon a time in mexico it's just they want to feel a part of what sergio leone did because he was so influential to them 
I don't even know if we've mentioned what film we're covering today, but... Yeah, it doesn't way. matter. <laughs> and, and Don Siegel. I had no idea who Don Siegel was when Clint Eastwood went on to make one of the modern... I don't know what order the early 90s westerns went in terms of release, but Eastwood, obviously accomplished director, makes Unforgiven, and he dedicates it to Don Siegel and Sergio Leone. If you talk about what your favorite western is, I remember watching a lot with my dad. Unforgiven was the one that stuck with me the first and still remains to this day, like this the finest western I had ever seen. I haven't rewatched it in years. Uh, another movie that I've rewatched more recently was The Quick and the Dead. I mean, it's a cartoony western, but God, it's delightful. Still good. And now that we've spent time with Sam Raimi, like, I think you would appreciate it even that much more. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But yeah, so... Clint Eastwood, he's not somebody that I always ran to the theater to watch. He's, and he's always just been a hack. I can't do him. Do his voice. It's all about the slow talking. Put something in your mouth. Uh, I mean, I'm not really good at voices either. So, yeah, he's got a deep voice. But you're closer. But he doesn't speak really quickly. I definitely have seen a lot of Clint Eastwood movies, both starring and what he's directed, which he obviously directs himself in a lot of his movies too. So many Clint Eastwood movies. I've seen a ton. But I'm with you where it's like, you don't hear it's Eastwood and you're just like, ooh, I gotta go. My dad was kind of like that. Like he, he's always been big on Eastwood. The worst Eastwood film I ever saw has got to be Space Cowboys though. I haven't seen it. Holy cow, is that bad? Wow. That seems like a delight to me though. Like I think I would have fun. I, I thought it would be. That's why I watched it like, year or two ago but i was like man this is one of those worst and he directed it yeah he's definitely a director that has made bad movies it just is what it is yeah so today we are covering the movies that by all accounts made clint eastwood a star and these just even the titles so we're doing the man with no name trilogy or the dollars trilogy the first one is what was it called a fistful of dollars. And then the cheeky sequel for a few dollars more. And then the most famous one, the third one, the good, the bad, and the ugly, where it has the famous line, do you feel lucky, punk? So that's exciting. I haven't watched it yet. but I don't think that's in that movie. You're confusing that because Dirty Harry is the one where it's like, is that a plastic gun, you pussy? <laughs> that's where he says that. No, that doesn't sound right. Uh, no, uh, that was the bridges in Madison County. Oh, yeah. That's right. what you're talking about. A fun fact about Dirty Harry, because we're talking about Dirty Harry for some reason. The fucking gun, the ma the 44 Magnum was on the verge of being discontinued. And like gun companies actually went to them and been like, can you put this gun in the movie? That's crazy. And the popularity uh, exploded. Clint Eastwood is in... It made some people's heads explode, I'm sure. Yeah. That's just the kind of guy Clint Eastwood is. So, I don't know how much history is necessary on these movies. I mean, the history is interesting. Clint Eastwood could not fucking get a break. He had a TV show. Still couldn't make much happen. Went to fucking Italy to make some movies with some guy. Because back then, Sergio Leone had, I only think, put out one movie before... Well, here's the misnomer about spaghetti westerns. I always thought that term referred to the fact that portions of Italy looked like the American Southwest, but that is not true. No. They call it spaghetti westerns because the western in America was so popular that the Europeans wanted to make their own cheap versions of it to sell to their people, and they just happened to be majority uh, directed by Italians. I know that A Fistful of Dollars and For a Few Dollars More were shot primarily in Spain. Yeah, in Spain. And the sequel we're talking about, For a Few Dollars More, like all the interior was shot in Rome. Yeah, it So is there you were finally in Italy, but for the first movie, it was pretty much in Spain. because, And this is what I loved about watching them first, where I was watching it, and I'm like, it's a desert. But it doesn't look anything like the American Southwest, I didn't think. I thought it was like a cheap forgery of it. And that's why I think a lot of people didn't take these movies seriously, this genre seriously, because they were low budget and they didn't really look like the American Southwest. It's just there was something about Eastwood and Leone teaming up on these movies that when the American audiences finally saw them, they couldn't deny the fact that these were something special. Westerns before this, I was reading, you know, the good guy was in white, the bad guy was in black, that kind of 
fantasy land western. Oh, the Lone Ranger, for sure. That kind of thing. You know where the Lone Ranger started? No. In Detroit. It was a radio show in Detroit. That's weird. Yeah. And then it became a television show, obviously. But these movies introduced dirty, sweaty guys with beards and who were supposed to be realistic, even though that wasn't necessarily realistic. Dangerous Mexicans. That was the overriding theme as well. And that's a fun thought, like, because... Leon had never seen the West. Like, he only knew about it. He had never yep. been to America when he made this fucking movie. In the first movie, does it take place in Texas? It takes place uh, on the American-Mexican border, but I believe it is still Texas. It almost felt like we're talking about the time when Texas was part of Mexico. It's a lot of history in that area, and I'm not that up on it. I know, I used to know a lot about the Alamo, but a lot of that information's left my head. Oh yeah, it's gone. But to your, to your question, I'm not really sure. I just know it's on the border, so maybe sometimes they're in Texas, sometimes they're in, officially in Mexico. For a few dollars more is mostly Santa Cruz and El Paso, I believe. But I can't recall what the first one is. No, the first one was just some whatever. Anyway, so these movies come out in Italy. They're big hits. They come out all over Europe. Don't come to America for a few years after that. And so this release schedule blows my mind and no wonder he blew up. It was perfect for him. Perfect. These three movies came out in the same year in America. Well, it was basically January july december and so within the course of a year freaking clint eastwood is just a household name the first two of the dollars trilogy are spanish italian and, and west german productions they shot the movies silent as they did with these b movies and then they would just dub in the voices afterwards is that what they did that's what they did but i think they spoke in their language their native language and eastwood obviously spoke english but he would still have to come back and and uh, adr is what they call it like where you just redub your own voice this is saying that the box office for just a few dollars more was 20 million and that's nuts 25 million all right so a fistful of dollars i just want to cover this real quick just because we haven't watched these and i want to talk about it they're confusing yet pretty basic why is it confusing just because there's a lot going on there's a lot of rival things going on and he's playing both sides i wasn't grasping the big picture until i kind of went over it again and read about it and then i was then it all made sense to me i had more of those questions with the for a few dollars more um but we'll get into that for a fistful of dollars it's fun because like the, they introduce him and he's just a rapscallion it's a guy that shows up in a town like how do i make some money and then decides to fuck with two rival gangs he initiates all of this watches as one gang murders the entire family of another gang and then he guns down the other gang like he's just there being a little rapscallion and you like him is this the birth of the anti-hero in modern american cinema is this i think it might be because he was either the good guy or the bad guy in Westerns. I think he said he was primarily the good guy. So when this role came where it was just like, wow, the audience will like you, but you're not a good person. <laughs> but you're still the hero in a way. And he found that pretty interesting. And that's why he wanted to play it. And I think it might kind of, it may have been the birth of the anti-hero. He literally, from the coffin, he watches that whole rival family get murdered because of him. Now, here's a serious question. Uh, was the old guy in for a few dollars more the same old guy from A Fistful of Dollars? Wasn't the old guy in the first movie, are you talking about the, the grave, the uh, Undertaker? Yeah. Yeah, who helps him yeah. recover after he gets his ass right. whooped. And then there's another old guy that he goes and speaks to. It might have been the same guy. And then it, there's just the movie ends with him riding out of town with a bunch of money. No, he gave the money away. Yes. So the A Few Dollars More... I'm sorry. So a fistful of dollars, yes, we meet the anti-hero, the man with no name, whose name is Joe, yeah. by the way, <laughs> in the first movie. He finds out this town has two rival families, basically, or gangs, whatever you want to call them. So he wants to make money. He finds a way to play them against each other. And that's really how the movie goes. But there is one woman. Her story kind of grabs him on a human level because she's basically like held hostage uh, as payment for this other guy cheating on this one guy. And she has a son. So the one good thing that Eastwood actually does while he's playing these people against each other and making money is he helps her and her husband and son escape and he gives them the money and then he watches them gun each other down and uh has to leave except there was one there's two old dudes that are nice to him and one of them is being held hostage and tortured so they because they want to find the man with no name 
So then he famously goes and saves his life. With the bulletproof vest. This is what I knew. Yes. About, yes, the man with no name and the Dollars trilogy, Back to the Future 2. And I never knew what Biff was watching while he was in the hot tub. I didn't know which one it was. I assumed it was the good, the bad, and the ugly. But that's where Marty gets the idea for the bulletproof vest is because he's seeing Clint Eastwood do it on the screen as he goes and talks to Biff. So anyways, yeah. So Eastwood has this idea because he knows that the, the bad guy shoots guys in the hearts and he's a great shot to wear a bulletproof vest so he makes one he puts it on he gets shot like seven or eight times keeps getting up i love those lines gotta get him in the heart yeah gotta get him in the heart like he's taunting him but also like don't shoot me in the head please yeah exactly (laughs) two things stood out to me when people got shot you would never see a bullet hole or blood the only time you saw blood is when they got punched But there was never any special effect work. They just didn't do it. And I think it was probably a sensor kind of thing. They just didn't want to worry about the blood or the bullet holes. Until for a few dollars more, that was one of the first things I noticed. There was multiple men shot in the head and there was a bullet hole in their head. I'm uh, imagining an escalation for the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then the other thing that stood out to me all the time is just how nonchalant they are with bullets flying everywhere. (laughs) They'll shoot your hat off the ground and you'll just be like, oh... Son of a bitch, you'll go and grab it. Or he's lighting his, cigar- his cigarillo, and they gets the cigarillo shot out of his mouth, but he's just like, ah. I'm like, that kind of took your face off. Bullets, metal flying through the air. Ah, that's the way it is. This is why the Old West is horrible. Anyway, so that's really it. That's a fistful of dollars. He comes into town, plays them against each other, makes some money, helps the family escape. It rides off in the sunset as the man with no name. How does he ride off into the sunset? Do you remember this? No, I don't. There's a horse attached to a carriage in town. And he just is like, I'll see you later. Walks up to this horse. Oh, he takes, takes it off it. of the fucking carriage <laughs> and just takes it. <laughs> like, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> um, uh, and so, yeah, we have for a few dollars more. I have a couple problems. Sure. They're ahead, small, small problems. First... The, what, why, what is the opening scene to this movie? Can you tell me? I don't know. You know, I was almost thinking like, are we watching him getting shot down? Is that going to happen at the end? But then it never came again. It was just like, was it really just a cool shot where a guy from far away got killed? And then he just laid there dead while the credits were rolling. And then we just move on from it. Was that one of Mortimer's yeah. kills, maybe? No idea. Like I think that's what it was. If you had to guess, I would say it was Lee Van Cleef's role as the bounty hunter Mortimer, former colonel. I think that was just him taking out a bounty. Uh, I mean, maybe. Because the only his story we get is set between the first and the second movie. Bounty hunting is a big deal. Mm. And now we have bounty hunters all over the West. And we are introduced to this German guy playing a bounty hunter. What was his name? Uh, the actor's Lee Van Cleef. Cleef. Uh, his character name is uh, Mortimer. Yeah, we meet him on the train right after that opening credit scene. Great fucking entrance. Yeah. This guy asks the guy, uh, where's the city? And he's like, it's there. He's like, okay, cool. And then the other guy next to him, another passenger's like, yeah, but this train doesn't stop there. You're going to have to go all the way and then turn around. And this guy, like a badass, just gets up pulls the emergency stop and gets off the fucking train because he it it made him scary to me like i was thinking he was gonna be the villain i had a hard time trusting him the entire movie we're not supposed to like them we're just supposed to respect them and i think they they, he definitely grabbed your respect as the movie went on because he was making the right decisions about things yes and he was a nice mentor in a way to clint eastwood who you didn't think needed a mentor but as far as putting them together as a buddy movie it worked so well for me. I enjoyed the sequel uh, a little more because of that than the first one, but the length got to me a little bit. I thought the movie was a little too long. A little too long. I completely agree. These would be perfect as 90-minute movies, and I'm a little scared for however long the good, the bad, and the ugly is going to be. Okay, so my other gripe, this series being called The Man With No Name, the fact that they call him Manko. Yeah, he's got a name in every one of the movies. (laughs) This movie does a great job of introducing the main characters because... They go, new guy, new guy, Clint, and then bad guy, or new guy, bad guy, Clint? I can't remember. Anyway, so they introduce him, and they show him coming into town looking for a bounty worth a 1000 This is the one where the guy was bragging how he should have been worth 10000 And he just slowly tracks him down. He's slow, he's methodical, he follows him into the street, and he shoots him with his weird little gun that has a longer hilt. Hilt. And then we see 
Clint Eastwood doing the same. Again, he's just such a rep scallion. His target is playing poker, walks up, takes the cards away, deals the two of them a hand. The guy, his, his target says, you never told me what the bet is. And Clint Eastwood's like, your life. And it was just... It's like the it way cool. of the West, where nobody interferes with someone looking that serious. This guy's gone to something. They just let him do what he needs to do. Here's the thing about Eastwood is that they could have ch- totally chose the wrong guy to play this role because there's not much to it. But it could have been a nothing role. It could have just been like somebody would be like, well, that actor's wooden. Uh, these movies are really good if it wasn't for the actor who played the lead, you know. But there's just something about Eastwood where it's just so in him that that's who he is. It's hard to say, but it's just the constant scowl and the talking, like you said, with his teeth closed. I mean, and even the outfit, the hat works, the poncho, the black jeans, like everything about it just... uh... I'm not so big on the vest. It actually reminds me of the Son of Frankenstein movie, (laughs) this this furry vest he wears. uh, Well, no, I don't But the poncho looks great. Pancho's always yeah. great. What I would have really liked in that scene is if his target had won and then had him shoot him anyway. Because <laughs> <laughs> he probably would have had to. Yeah, so there's a little fun bounty hunter thing going on. So you're, you're getting the idea that they're just both in that business and you expect them to be rivals now and there's going to be some coming together. Uh, so that's what happens because there's a big bounty on this guy that just got broken out of prison. Mortimer goes, turns in his bounty, gets his thousand bucks, and then sees a poster for a guy who's worth ten grand. No! They introduce the villain first. Yeah. They introduce. Yeah, you're right. They have to. Yeah. Uh, bounty hunter, villain. Villain is and Indio. Then Indio. Because yeah. he gets busted out of. Is he busted out of prison? Yeah. So his his group comes and kills all the guards and busts him out. And he's laughing like a maniac. And then they switch to where that's what the poster's made of. That's when the, Mortimer sees the poster. Right. 10 grand. And then the man with no name obviously wants the same bounty. But India worked so well as a villain because I even thought for a 1965 movie, it was pretty harsh. The guy that turned him in and then why he was in prison, he killed their family. Now, we didn't see any of it, but he had them killed. Like, it was pretty crazy to think that an 18-year-month-old just got shot. That, that was an amazing scene. So, yeah, bad guy breaks out. First thing he does is he goes after the fucking bounty hunter that had him arrested or whoever that guy was. I think it was one of his men that turned him in for the reward. I think that's what it was. I don't think he was a bounty hunter, but that would be my guess. And yeah, he takes his family outside, shoots them. His little baby. And then we establish this thing where it's like, you have until the music stops playing. When the music stops playing, we have a shoot off and, and then he kills him. And what I also liked is that he has this, uh, these visions, these memories that he thinks about this woman and her fiance or something like that. And obviously he did something very bad to them and it's bothering him. And he clearly goes into this drug like, he's an addict, so he tries to, like... It's probably just pot. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's um, uh, opium, you know? the opi- Everybody was big into opium. I'm guessing opium. Uh, I was just amazed at how much character development this villain got. Yeah. So he wasn't just your average, oh, he's Mexican and he's horrible, because this is a, a Western. It's like, wow, there's actually, like, something that bothers him, and this is why he drugs himself up all the time. But he can't help it. He's such a bad dude. And that's where he got the watch from. You know, that's worth pointing out. For these movies being in the 60s, I don't know if they're just... I mean, I'm sure it's just because they're European, but they're really not racist. They're not racist because they take place in that area. And they just happen to be, it's like gangs, you know? Here's here's a gangster movie with cowboys, basically. But it is just like, if you only watch these movies, you get the feeling that Mexico is just a bunch of, like, horrible people. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, we have the bounty hunters meet each other in Clint Eastwood uh the man with no name he's a rapscallion you keep saying rapscallion he's a rapscallion man (laughs) he's a troublemaker and I love this movie he sends the guy that runs the hotel up to (laughs) Mortimer's room to pack his bags and put his bags on the train because he wants him to leave and don't say anything to him just walk into his room grab his clothes and walk out and this poor innkeeper's like all right (laughs) and so we get this showdown in the street where they are literally just testing each other i thought it was going to come to something more who does what first clint shoots his hat off does he shoot off his head i don't know but it keeps falling on the ground and then when mortimer goes to pick it up he shoots it again so it just keeps going further and further back in the street and then he gets to a point where he reaches the limit of his bullets distance yes and i thought that was a thing that mortimer was doing to test the accuracy of this guy yes. how far can he shoot how far and i thought yeah. that would come back and it never does no but it showed that more it, it was the moment that 
uh, the man with no name realized how serious and quality this bounty hunter was. He can't push him around anymore because Clint couldn't shoot any farther. And yet Mortimer brings out his super gun and blows the hat off his head and then shoots it in the sky a couple times. Oh, yeah, Junior, I can shoot even farther than you. And then that's like, oh, we're friends now. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. essentially what it was. So it worked out. You want to team up? And I, I even feel like Clint expected a team up at that point, but he was trying to play it cool. But I think they both realized that they were going to get in each other's way and it wouldn't end well. So they might as well team up and maybe they can get something out of it. But even though they team up, they're still, they have their own. They're still fucking around. They're both rapscallions. They're, they're like, they're not Rapscans. trying to screw the other one necessarily. They're just trying to get rid of the other one by tr- by yeah. making a couple moves of their own. So they established that there's like 15 people in this gang. The main guy is worth like 10. The rest of the gang is worth like 20. They're individually worth like one was worth a thousand. One, one was worth two. And I think when they added it up, because Mortimer was like, well, you can have Indios, the main guy's bounty, with for 10. I'll take the other guys. And then Clint was like, well, that might be even more than 10. So maybe it was like 12 or something or 14. Yeah. But they team up. They team up. And it's a constant battle of the wits where Mortimer's like, you got to join their gang. We need somebody on the inside. And they're going to rob a bank that's supposed to be impossible to rob. Except even the plot of this is so much more detailed. Like there is a plot. Maybe that's the biggest difference. Is there's a heist, they have to stop the heist. A lot more story structure. Uh, Indio's cellmate, is it Indigo or Indio? Indio. Indio's cellmate designed the safe at the bank. And that's what where he hatched the plan to rob the bank. Is that what he was? Because he had like a little model of the safe. That he yeah, he had the up. model of it. So I think that's it essentially what gotcha. it was. That makes sense. And he has this amazing plan to rob this bank that's unrobbable. They're staking it out. They're watching the guards. Oh, there's so many parts of this movie. I love where he approaches the bad guys and strikes the match on them to light yeah, it. Yeah, right. Just seeing what they would do. And because they were casing the bank, they wouldn't do anything. Oh, so and that's, they... that was um the, the hunchback yeah. was Klaus Kinski. And I don't know if you know him, but he went on to star in five or six of Werner Herzog's movies. He was the guy in Die Hard, wasn't he? No, he was not in Die Hard. That wasn't him. But no, he was in um, Aguirre, The Wrath of God, which uh, is a crazy movie. And then he was in... Uh, Fitzcarraldo, the movie about the guy that has the ship moved over the mountain. And then he was in uh, Nosferatu, Werner Herzog's version of that movie, remake of the movie. He's a crazy actor. Oh my God, is Klaus Kinski the guy that's crazy that Werner Herzog hated? Yes. Really? They hated and loved each other. He called him his best fiend. He found him the most interesting and greatest actor of his generation, but they almost killed each other, like with firearms sometimes. Over and over and over. Yeah, and they kept working with each other. That's awesome. I did not realize it was him. Yeah. Anyway, so this is like one of his first roles, I think, you know, or as far as popular roles goes. But yeah, he's like a hunchback. Mortimer strikes a match on him. and But they can't do anything because they're casing the joint. They don't want to get in trouble. I did think that was a nice touch. And Clint is kind of in and out of the gang, but he's just trying to make it seem like he's still a part of them. Um, and then they rob the bank and they find a way to do it because they blow the wall out the back and steal the safe. They got it down pretty well. Something I really liked about the robbery, Clint and... Why can't I think of this guy's Mortimer. name? You can call him Manko and Mortimer. 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 Clinton Mortimer. Uh, they have this plan, and they're going to take them out at the robbery, and they're stationed, and they're waiting, and the gang outsmarted them and everybody else by blowing out the wall, stealing the safe, and being gone. So Clint tells Indio and the gang, you know, pretending still to be part of their gang, even though he wasn't there for the robbery. I don't know. It was a little weird. Because Mortimer's plan is like, tell him to go north. That's where we'll ambush them. So he goes and tells them, hey, don't go north. <laughs> that could be an ambush. Why don't you go south? But then Mortimer is already one step ahead of him. So he ends up where he was trying to get the gang to go anyways. So it's like, ah, fuck. But then that's when Mortimer join- joins to say, like, I'm a safe cracker. I can get it open without you destroying half of the money in there. They get the safe open, but everybody has to wait around a month for the heat to die down and then they'll get their payment yeah essentially and then this part i gotta admit i kind of fell asleep (laughs) for this next stuff i read about it but i fell asleep during the nighttime stuff i guess uh so i mean essentially indio knows the whole time that these guys are just bounty hunters and he's playing them and everybody's playing everybody (laughs) this is another rapscallion moment where clint eastwood is sneaking into the room by going through the roof of where the money's being held and Mortimer's already fucking there stealing the money. And so they switch out the money 
and he locks it back up. They come out through the roof and just in a real, I want to say like Three Stooges moment, they're stepping down off of the roof and they're stepping out of the guys' backs because they're waiting for them. <laughs> and they're like, ah, yeah, oh, fuck. And so this is where they just get the shit kicked out of them. I'm assuming it happens in every one of these movies. Clint Eastwood is going to get beat up. Yeah, he got pretty beat up in a fistful of dollars, too. So isn't that the point where Indio kind of spills the fact that he knew all along they were bounty hunters? And then he uses them Fuck yeah. to try to thin out his people. Because if he has less of a crew, he doesn't have to share the money with them. Yes, they have them chained up. Indio has a guy kill the guy that is holding them and then let them go. And then he used the knife of one of his crew or other crew and kills him. He tells the rest of his crew that they escaped and killed them or something. No, I like don't know. He, he tells the rest of the crew that his guy with the knife is who betrayed them and let them go. So now you all got to go after them or something like that. Everybody's playing everybody else. And him and another guy are going to leave. Because they have like a million dollars, I believe. Yeah, just under a million dollars. So he's going to go get the money. And then the other guy is killed by one of his gang members who was like, I'm not falling for your shit. I know what you're doing. And then they open up the money and it's just his wanted poster. And then the two bounty hunters kill off all of his men. And then they kill Indio, but not before we find out what he's been thinking about. Yeah, because he has the watch again, and he says when the music ends, let's go for our guns and we'll have a shootout with Mortimer. Oh, yeah, he disarms He disarms Mortimer. Yes. Yeah. Um, but then once the music ends, the music starts again on Clint's watch, which is the same one because Clint took it from Mortimer. Yes. And it turns out that Mortimer... Mortimer's sister is the woman in Indio's memory that he ended up killing her husband and raping her and killing her. Or she killed herself after he raped her or something like that. She killed yeah. herself. And that's what bothered him. Like, this woman killed herself rather than be raped by me. Why? So now you find out that it wasn't just bounty hunting for Mortimer. It was revenge. And he got his revenge. Yes. And then what does he tell Clint? Hey, keep the money. I don't even want it anymore. Yep. So I thought that was a pretty nice ending. It was a great ending. And then, the, of course, we see Clint <laughs> yeah. just throwing everybody's bodies in the back of a trailer. No bodies, no bounty. I guess that's how it works. And he rides off into the sunset again. And all of the bank money, which I'm assuming he's going to return. That's my guess. I mean, if he took the time to take the bodies, he must be going to get the bounty, not just leaving with the money. Although he probably could have just left for the money. I don't know. And that was it. That was, for a few dollars more, a witty... Great, awesome, fun, cool, pretty movie. Yes, okay, so Joseph Egger was the old man, the coffin builder in A Fistful of Dollars, and then he plays Prophet in a, for a few dollars more. So he is the same old man, but maybe a different character. It would have been nice if it had been the same yeah. guy. Old Prophet. But uh, it was his final film, so... There you go. Uh, what do you think about the music by Ennio Morricone? Is that how you say his name? It's as much as I recognize any music. Yeah. It was good. I think it's good, but I think it's cheesy. I just think it's cheesy. I know it fits the Western, but the constant, ho, oh, hey, ho, oh, it's pretty cheesy. And I know that like Tarantino is such a fan that he tried to... Now, and I know that Morricone made the music for um, The Hateful Eight his western really like he, it was like one of the I, th I think he's is he dead now is he alive i don't know it was like one of the last movies he's been working on yeah so he died in 2020 why wow, he's 91 holy cow um wow but i just uh, it's one of the things that was kind of cheesy in the 60s that i just don't think has carried on but the cool flamenco guitar like that has the mandalorian music for instance is a complete homage to morricone's stuff like but that's like a cool way of doing an homage to his music so that stuff's lasted but a lot of that music that he made for the dollars trilogy i don't know it's a little it's a little corny to me yeah just as not being a music guy i i heard it it was there i didn't have any thoughts yeah. on it and the title sequences are pretty funny very animated yeah they were they need to bring title or credits back to the beginning of films i know it's impossible now with the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds but i like them i think it's fine to well you just pick out the important people <laughs> you don't need to have the vfx artists <laughs> there's too fucking many there's i just like, a thousand like when the end i like the shows end. up and you know the movie's just cut into dark i'm gonna do that you know what with this rough cut of the movie i'm gonna go big on but you see the problem is 
as film like early film students or young filmmakers and film students sometimes the coolest things they do in their movies is the title sequence and then the rest of the movie isn't isn't nearly as cool so you want to be careful about that too you don't want to make your titles too fancy and it doesn't support the quality of the movie you're watching so i want to do something fun with my titles but i don't want to go too crazy you know can't be higher quality than the movie themselves yeah that's a good uh i'm not usually good at Again, I'm the storytelling guy. I like a good story. It's why I like movies. Yeah. But I did absolutely notice his style going really close. Those really famous just close-ups of their eyes and their faces. That was just all over these movies, and I loved it. Yeah, I liked it. And then he would have action still happening in the back because he would have the face on one side and then action in the back still. I th- that, was, that, I think, is what stood out to a lot of people at that time, too. It was good shit. It's fun to watch a movie that's actually good. And I feel that A Few Dollars More is a better film than A Fistful of Dollars. So right now I'm A Fistful of Dollars for, and then for A Few Dollars More. Yeah, It's just something about having Morricone, not Morricone, uh, Mortimer, be part of this movie that elevates the film for me, is that there was a second bounty hunter and they could play off each other. That just made it a better movie to me. But, I may, but I'm often confused about not confused but i'm also pushed in that direction because i remember when we were younger i always thought that die hard with a vengeance was a better movie than die hard because of samuel jackson and that there was just more of a buddy comedy which i really liked but as i got older i realized that doesn't make that movie better than die hard it just made it a worthy sequel to die hard yes so maybe i I am maybe i'm tricked into thinking that about it as well that where a fistful of dollars is probably the better film but for a few dollars more is definitely a worthy sequel of that first movie. Yes, yes. That we can completely agree there with. There you go. Um, and I think everybody should watch these. I think they should too. And I'm excited for the next one. Yeah, I'm excited to watch that as well. And we'll be talking about that on the next episode. Bet your yeah. ass we will. This has been an episode of Aaron and Justin Talk Sequels. I'm Justin. I'm Aaron. And thank you for listening. Talk to you soon. Love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.